For state budgets around the country, the pandemic and the resulting shutdowns mean a huge loss of revenue with likely cutbacks in services. According to the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation, the amount of revenue that was expected until recently for the coming fiscal year will be down by 15% or almost $4 billion. To explain what that could mean in Massachusetts is the foundation's president, Eileen McEnany. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Eileen. My pleasure, Chris. Now, for some people, 15% might not sound like a whole lot of uh, money, but how big a deal is this in Massachusetts? Well, it's a very big deal. And, and, and so I think it's important. Our numbers actually exceeded $4 billion. I think that we had estimated it was $4.4 billion. And, and it's important to know that's just in tax revenue, um, non-tax revenue. So things like fees and fines and all of that will probably also decline. Um, and, you know, in a state budget, there are some things that have to be paid, like debt that the state owes or the mass health program. And so that's called non-discretionary spending. But so for discretionary spending, the cuts could be significantly more than the 15 percent. Well, since you mentioned the, the health program, I think a lot of us are wondering about that right now, because aside from the usual demand for that, uh, you have all these people who are newly unemployed who maybe have lost insurance. So what do you think that's going to mean? Well, it, it could mean there'll be a big uptick in the number of enrollees in mass health. We haven't seen it yet, but there aren't any um, new statistics out with respect to that. But I mean, I think as people lose their job, it, it's likely they may lose their health care as well. So that will put a lot of pressure on the state's Medicaid program. Well, I know we're, we're talking about all these different revenue streams, uh, the biggest being the income tax, but you've also got the sales tax, you've got the capital gains tax, and they're all going down. Uh, talk about capital gains. W what does that mean? Sure. So, you know, Massachusetts relies on income tax disproportionately, and a big portion of that is capital gains. And as we all know, capital gains really mirror the stock market, and there's been a lot of volatility. So I think you'll see a, a steep decline in capital gains next year as a result of all that. And, and MTF was already predicting, so the Mass Taxpayers Foundation, sorry for the acronym, but we were already predicting that capital gains would probably come in about $500 million less than projected. So there's going to be a big gap there. And that money typically... Well, yeah, please, yeah is deposited into the stabilization fund. So there'll be less money that will go into the stabilization fund if that in fact happens. Now, one of the things I know is the stabilization fund or, or rainy day fund uh, has um, about maybe what, uh, almost 4 billion in it right now? Three and a half billion. Three and a half. So uh, it, it looks like we can't tap that out in one year. It, it, so it, it, that seems to leave a pretty big gap as far as state spending. Well, it does. And I think you're absolutely right that we can't tap that in one year because this could last for multiple years. And so we're going to need to use it judiciously. Um, but it, it will help on the margins, but it certainly isn't going to solve all the budget challenges because the state budget is about $45 billion. And so three and a half billion, as large as it sounds in isolation, is not going to be the fix. Um, talk about the MBTA because uh, you, you got a problem there because the sales tax revenue supporting the T is going to be down. And, and looking forward, even post pandemic, uh, I imagine ridership is probably going to suffer, and that means more lost revenue too. So pile that up together. What does that mean, you think? It means a big challenge financially for the MBTA because I think you're absolutely right that we're not going to see the ridership restored until. People feel safe being in close spaces and until they're pretty sure that the, the tea is cleaned. And, and, and um, so I, I think we have a ways to go before people will resume their, their commutes the way they did beforehand. Sales tax also means uh, a challenge for uh, capital money for school buildings and school building repairs. Uh, uh, you think that might hold up at least for a while, don't you? Yeah, so it looks like, I mean, just the way that the School Building Assistance Authority is funded, it, I think it's okay in the near term, but it relies on some money from sales tax, and to the extent that we've seen a really steep decline in sales tax, um, there could be implications for that, you know, in, in a year or so. Now, one of the uh, choices confronting uh, the, the state is to... Uh, 
uh, maybe put in less money for public employee pensions uh, for the time being, but I guess that could also incur some other costs when it comes to borrowing. I mean, how would you come down on that kind of a choice? So I think skipping a pension payment would not be the first place I would look to try to balance the state's budget because that money is owed to pensioners and you will have to replenish it and, and it will just be more costly. I mean, we all know the, the value of compounding is really important. You don't want to miss the payment. Um, you know, but it has been used in the past, so it's not without precedent, but that wouldn't be the first place I would turn. Now, another thing the state does is, is it provides a lot of money for local aid, including money for education. Um, what do you see happening with that now? Well, I think that there are a couple of issues. There's, you know, the, the traditional local aid, if you will, but then recently the legislature passed the Student Opportunity Act, which expanded state funding for education with a cost of about one and a half billion over seven years. And that was passed without a funding mechanism. So that's, that adds additional pressure um, to school budgets. And, and, and I think, you know, they might have to consider e extending the time frame that they implement that. That would be one potential way to do it. Um, but but that will, that's a big portion of state spending that has to be addressed. And of course, you've got cities and towns that are probably going to be taking budget hits as well. So I guess this is going to be painful for them. It is. I think no one will be spared the pain. Right. Because another uh, question here is, is how do you get help from Washington? Because uh, a lot of other states need this right now. And there's some pushback from Washington as well. What, what, is, what do you think would be realistic for, for Massachusetts? I, I do think that the federal government will have to provide assistance. And, you know, I, I just look at a very concrete example of where the federal government postponed tax payments so that people don't have to pay their taxes. They didn't pay in April, they'll pay in July instead, which is okay for the federal government because it can print money. But at the state level, it means money expected in the current fiscal year won't be paid until the next fiscal year. So it poses a very concrete short-term challenge for the states. But I think longer term, um, the, Fed, the Congress and, and, and the federal government will have to come through for states. One of the other things, uh, and maybe this is even more pressing than the question about pensions for public employees, is that uh, what about unemployment insurance? We have a fund for that. There are so many people uh, applying now for the benefits that that could be running out too. Uh, what does the state have to keep an eye on there? Well, certainly they don't want that trust fund to, to be um, depleted so that they can't pay, pay the claims, right? Many people are relying on that. Typically though, the state is able to borrow from the federal government if they run low on funds and then they pay it back over a period of time. But I think that um, you know, that's another area where we'll, we'll be looking to the federal government for assistance. Because one of the things, and this is maybe about the bigger picture, is that over the past, you know, several decades maybe, we have a state budget that's sort of pegged on the kind of state economy we have. Do you see this pandemic uh, um, reshaping that economy in some fundamental way that drives the budgets of the future? I, I think that there will be a reshaping. And, and I think there are ways that are obvious right now in some that we haven't even begin to con we haven't begun to contemplate. You know, one, one concrete way, I think, though, is there are a lot of people working remotely, and it's been somewhat seamless for them. So I think you will see um, people working remotely. I think shopping online is something that will accelerate. And, and, and so um, what that means for sales tax collections from remote sellers remains to be seen. Um, but, but I do think there will be a fundamental shift in, in, in the way our economy operates as a result of this pandemic. 